hey, it's me, Brian. I've got a stupid hat on, and I'm just sitting here talking about movies, and I think I'm so funny, you know, blah, blah. Today's movie is from 1966, and it's the directorial debut from disgraced and neurotic filmmaker Woody Allen, and it's like nothing else in his filmography. Uh, this is a comedy in the best sense of the word in that it's broad, it's silly, it's uh, self-aware, and it's parodical in nature. It's actually simply uh, the second in a series of three uh, international secret police Japanese spy movies. This one's called Key of Keys. And it's just that film with new dialogue superimposed on top of it so that you create a completely new plot and all the scenes are edited in a different order. This whole thing started because American International Pictures acquired the rights to this film, The Key of Keys. They quickly learned that American audiences didn't know what to make of it. And so the solution was the president said, hey, let's just give it to a bright young comic to put his own dialogue over it. I cannot imagine that ever happening in a million years. This is back when people took chances. That doesn't happen anymore. This was made during a time when spy movies were the biggest freaking thing in the world, thanks to James Bond ushering in that whole trend. And this was now in the mid-60s, so now we're almost getting up to spy movie fatigue. But hey, who might argue with great spy TV shows and movies? Yeah, this this one. Now, there's no doubt in my mind that this film was an influence on Mystery Science Theater 3000 and their approach to comedy. But at the same time, I think there's a much more specific example of a film that I covered on this channel years ago called J-Men Forever. Hi, I'm Brian Kiss. <laughs> because in J-Men Forever, not only is there old movie footage with superimposed new dialogue over it, but there's also new scenes that are intercut into the film to kind of help make the narrative a little bit more understandable. And in this film, it opens with Alan talking directly to the camera, explaining what you're about to see, which is pretty much verbatim what happened in real life, the way he explains it. And for me, that kind of dulls the effect of the movie slightly. Then again, that may have been a studio note, and in fact, the studio did interfere with this film. The studio added 20 minutes or so of new footage so that it, they could just pad it out so that it was 80 minutes so they could stick it in theaters because it was originally supposed to be a TV movie special and some of the stuff that they added was just more footage from another one of the international uh, secret police films with new dialogue with someone sounding like Woody Allen but it wasn't Woody Allen there's uh, some footage of the Lovin Spoonful playing I found that funny perhaps unintentionally funny because you have scenes of people in a Japanese nightclub dancing around to the music and then it just cuts to the Lovin Spoonful playing and it gets so meta that at the very end over the ending credits there's a woman strip teasing and the credits are saying something to the effect of if you're not watching this woman right now you got to get your head checked now the big question is can such a format sustain a 80 minute movie i want to say yes i was entertained i thought there were enough consistent laughs and the format didn't really grow tired throughout the movie i will admit that uh usually around halfway is when i'll start to kind of zone out a little bit this is exactly the sort of thing that i would point to when discussing creativity because if you were to go on a video of like say led zeppelin and look at the youtube comments half of them are going to be a 50 60 70 year old guy going See, kids, this is back when people had talent and they played instruments and they didn't just plug in their computer and press play and charge you $150. Well, you could make blues songs and use the same blues riffs and rip them off from artists that you never give credit for, or you could take something pre-existing and recontextualize it and chop it up and make something that's commenting on the original while also just being kind of a interesting, unique, silly piece of art that's a little bit more daring. Here and there, there are some racial stereotype jokes, but it doesn't really bog down the movie too much. And in fact, some of those jokes uh, elicit groans from the other characters. But I did notice that like in the opening animated opening titles, uh, Woody Allen's cartoon drawing has a giant nose because he has a great sense of smell so who to recommend this to i liked it i found it funny i think anybody who enjoys meta humor on shows like mystery science theater 3000 or the simpsons or even monty python 
would probably get some enjoyment out of this. Uh, maybe not Grandma, who's more familiar with Annie Hall and stuff like that. But, you know, it's a great movie to kind of jump into in the middle, you know, if it comes on TV and you don't really have to follow the plot. Uh, and you get some belly laughs at any point in the movie, so... Woody, because the story is a little bit difficult to follow, would you give the audience and myself a brief rundown on what's gone on so far? No. It was kind of exciting to see a movie that breaks the usual form of movies and comments on it altogether. So yeah, great, ambitious first movie for a, a first-time director. It's ballsy. Speaking of balls, stay sexy.